good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to the people on the West Coast. This is our Adelo Express Deep Dive webinar. On the call today, you will have myself, Jerry Wilson, as well as Jeff Moore, the two vice presidents of Adelo. We will be able to go into the software. We've got some different sections we're going to talk about and also answer questions as we go along. A couple of housekeeping things that we're going to keep everyone muted. And until we do the Q&A, then we'll unmute for that. Jeff and I will be monitoring the chat window. When uh, I'm presenting, Jeff will monitor. And when Jeff's presenting, I will monitor. So we will answer some questions via the chat. But most of these we will answer verbally on the presentation. So we do do, we certainly do encourage your questions. That is how you learn and that's how we get the best results from these webinars. You just sitting there and going through and just listening to us preach is not gonna be what we want. We really want you involved and we will certainly uh, take whatever time's necessary to answer your questions. The agenda is the only thing that's fixed. Each one of these topics we will cover in pretty much the order you see them here. The uh, individual conversations we have within those topics are not scripted. We're going to be free, free floating and free, free flowing during the, the, each one of these agenda items. But we will cover each of these in detail and give you as much information as we possibly can. Now, I'm going to switch over now to my iPad, and we're going to start with the initial setup and how that looks. So hang on just a second while we switch screens. And there you go. That's my iPad. As you probably already know, we've talked about it before. I've got an iPad Pro. My iPad Pro is about two years old, so it's not the most current version, but it is very good about showing the product in that it does have that big screen. So you'll get to this initial screen here when you download the app. You're asked to enter an email, your store name, and then your password, and then verify the password and sign up. If you do not wish to do that, you can continue using Facebook. This will allow you a quick, easy login. Once you hit this and once you sign up, once you create this account, you have a 30-day clock that's ticking. So in 30 days, this account is going to go away. So when you have a customer and you want them to play with it, and you want them to, to experiment with building their own databases and such, you have 30 days, and that's it. I already have an account, so I'm going to use this button here. Here you enter in either your email or your phone number. I'm going to use my keyboard, enter my phone number, Got to enter the right phone number. And then my, my little password. I just have a little quick one. Log it in. Now, these are the stores that I've created. You would have this look here, which is going to show all your demo stores. You then can choose which one of these you would like to use. The only thing you don't have here is when you use these demos, you do not have access to the back office from here. So this is only for store level demos, but it's, they, they have some good product here and good demo databases. At the bottom you see you have create my store. So this is where you would absolutely create a new store. Device number, and then start filling out the form. You'll notice on the left hand side, you have the little exclamation points for each of these three areas that tells me and tells you that we're not done with that area. There are some required fields that have to be entered. So let's go ahead and do that. We're gonna do a little diner today. Now the address, that is a default from the iPad. It knows where I'm located and that's true. I'm on the 11th green at the Wood Station Golf Club. But if that's not your address, go ahead and put in the correct address 
that for your your system. All the rest of that is defaulted. My phone number is there. You can enter the web address. Email is required. Jeff, I'm laughing. They caught me. They caught me on the on the golf course today. Putting in the sales tax, default discount rate is good. And what industry? Now this is where it's going to start setting your flags for you. So if you are in a restaurant, then what kind of category are you? Table service, fine dining, quick service, fast casual, buffet. So what do you think a diner is? Maybe fast casual? I do fast casual. Yeah. Then select a cuisine. I'm going to do it's American. American. Yeah. And the style. Other. Okay. So now you've got your defaults set. These are setting flags as I'm going through here. It's turning some on, some off, making this more of an easy config for your customer or for your, your install team. We've set a lot of flags for you by doing this. Items. So now you can come in and under the, the default to the beverage, water, price, and we're going to put it zero. But then you can add to that. And I'm just going to add in some really quick little prices so you can see how easy this is. The other flag you have on the right is taxable, non-taxable. Simple, simple. Add another category, you touch that, add in your category then. Add in items for that category now. And the price. You just continue to do this for each item that you're going to have in your in, in the database. When Harry first gave this program to me at, a, at one of our meetings, he sent me in front of his iPad gave me a barbecue database and said, here, go. And I had to create the database, the full menu for this for this barbecue restaurant based just without ever seeing Adelo Express in my life. And 22 minutes later, we had a working database with every item, every modifier, every price. The cash drawers were popping, printers were printing, receipt printers as well as kitchen printers. So as you see, it is just this simple, just to go through and enter the items, enter the categories and groups. Next up is staff. It's got me as the default because that's how I registered. I'm gonna put in my passcode. And now I've got three green check marks on the left. That tells me that I have now a working store. I could then uh, continue adding items, can he, continuing adding staff, and so forth. But I'm just going to go ahead and, and touch build my store now, and that's exactly what it's doing. It's on the uh, cloud, it is building the store, syncing it to the iPad, and then downloading it to the iPad. So now I'm ready to go. So I have a base store now. There's the soda or the coffee, water, tea, and the sandwiches that I built. We now can ring up an, what, these items. Cashier, and you'll see it kind of wiggling at me. It's telling me we don't have a cashier signed in yet. So let's go ahead and, and sign in a cashier. Now I can tender out. So that is up and running in just about five minutes, guys.
that's just how easy it is to do for Delo Express. Obviously, more more complex databases are going to take a little bit longer, but that's what we're going to do today is show you how to do that. All right, now I'm going to make you the presenter so that you can do the device and store setup. Sounds fantastic. So I have the easy part of this. Um, the device setup is is um, really probably one of the easiest you'll ever do. Um, once you have your your uh, software loaded, your device is simply plugged into the wall. Um, you click the little menu key here at the top and you go down to hardware and it's automatically going to search the network and look for any of the approved hardware that it can be set up for both um, your printers and your cash drawers. And as you see, it automatically went in, it found my Epson TM88 for me and this happens to be a cat, uh, printer I have set up uh, already but literally to set it up all I had to do was choose that it was connected click on that and in this case I do have a cash drawer connected to that so I have that turned on uh, I can even do a little print test if I wanted to and it will tell me what the IP address is you may have just heard that in the back side uh, prints a little tag tells me what the IP address is um, and it's ready to go your kitchen printers are exactly the same. When I click on my kitchen printers, it's gonna search my network. It's going to find whatever printers are available. Uh, I'm gonna choose my star TSP here. And there we go like that. And I can even do a test print if I'd like uh, to that printer. And my kitchen printer number one is set up. I could go ahead and do the same thing for kitchen printer two, three, four, five, six, all the way down. I can set up bar printers this way my packager printer and my label printer this way um, and it's all items that it's just going to detect and move forward uh, so it makes it extremely simple uh, by the way it does the same for your emv devices uh, when you set up your emv devices those are pre-configured on the cloud for you uh, so the first time you actually come in you have an order when you click on the the cashier symbol there uh, and the first time you click on the credit card option, if it can detect your device, uh, but I'm going to choose my my order there, and I'm going to click on the the little dollar symbol like that. And when you do check credit card or debit, any one of these two in the right corner here, it's going to come up and look for your your payment device. And in my case, it's going to try to locate it. It's going to tell me uh, it's not going to find it because I've unplugged it and it's gonna tell me which devices are available. And I'm simply gonna choose whichever device I wanna use and my device setup is finished. So that's ready to go. Obviously mine's unplugged, so it's not gonna come back on. So setting up your hardware devices are extremely simple. If somebody wants to use um, a barcode uh, reader, uh, we typically recommend the Bluetooth bar barcode readers. They work really well. And you just simply pair them with your iPad and they work. Um, you don't have to do anything else to go set those devices up. So that's extremely simple. This uh, is a feature that he's showing you, this, this automatic printer setup that took a little while to do. It's not a common feature in point of sale. It is rather unique. It also makes it so the end user can modify or, or do their own printers is what I'm trying to say. Do their own devices. So it, it does help with the setup. It helps with the uh, initial training. It makes this almost a um, self-install. I say almost because it does have some things that would get in, we're about to get into that are a little more detailed. But this is a very, very powerful feature. Uh, Frank's asking a question I really want to address. Normally I don't try to tackle yep. these, but I really want to get onto this. He's asking, where do you set up the IP address for the PAX unit? You don't, Frank. That's the amazing part, is it's auto-detected. So one of the things is we simply add the serial number to your account um, on the cloud, letting the, the system know that you're authorized to use that device. And the PAX devices automatically communicate to the cloud every time they're turned on and off, every time um, they complete a transaction. They let us know what the current IP address is and what the port number is. And because of that, we just gather that information 
and put it directly into the system. You don't ever actually have to go set something up. Um, it auto detects it for you and just keeps going. Uh, what that really means is if the IP address changes, uh, just like mine, when you when you load an order here, and since mine's unplugged, uh, when you come in here to do this, let's say it can't detect it, uh, which is what mine's doing, or if the IP address has changed, it will come into this screen right here like this. You'll be able to literally select that device again. Uh, it will have the new IP address, and you click um, continue and go forward. That's it. Um, so it's much, much easier. Uh, and there is no uh, EDC or anything like that to install. Um, so it's, it's much, much easier to go set up. Um, so really, really easy. another question. So when cashing out, go to the cash out screen, then swipe card on the machine. Yeah. So when you come into the, the settlement screen like this, you're going to choose the payment type, you know, hit credit card and literally, yep. You're then at that point, the EMV device takes over and you follow the prompts on the EMV device. So however they've set that up, if they're requiring EMV, if they're gonna do uh, just the swipe on the EMV, um, you know, the, that's up to them how they wanna configure that. There's no card swipe on the iPad. It is all on the uh, PAX unit. Everything's there. So uh, I love it. If the, what if the, the PAX unit's actually uh, set up by DHCP? Yeah. Every time the the system detects if it boots up, um, the IP address is updated, Frank. So it doesn't. It's not an issue. Um, DHCP or static, it's not a problem. We still do recommend people have static IP addresses, um, but if for some reason during the transaction between boot up and during the transaction, if your IP address changed, you would get that screen giving you a chance to either select a different device or choose the updated device. That's all it is. So the question really, is, so the, the PAX device is just a glorified MSR reader. That's what they've always been. Yeah. <laughs> they do the chip, dip, dip thing. They can dip the card or swipe the card. Yeah, they're just an over glorified MSR reader for the most part. Um, What's the best way to keep up with the uh, printers? When you have multiple printers on the network, can you label them? So they actually come up here. Let me go back into my hardware section. Um, and we're going to choose here. You'll notice they come up and it automatically tells you what is the, the detected name of that printer and what is the IP address of that printer, um, giving you at least some information about what that printer is. You're not going to be able to go in here and say, this is a kitchen printer, this is this, because if the IP address changed, we're not getting a labeling information back from the printer. It's not telling us that it's a kitchen printer. Um, and obviously we're detecting the, the MAC address and the IP address. So if you did label them or we did put that kind of functionality in, every time the IP address changed, you'd lose your label. Um, that would be the, the problem. Realistically, the manufacturer would have to go in and be able to put a label on that printer and, tell it, and propagate that to us. And at this time, that's just not a feature. Um, you know, my suggestion is here again, if they're if that's important to you and it's something they want, they can definitely take a labeler and put the IP address on the printer and make them static um, if that's a problem. Um, we do allow you to go ahead and test them. And when you do test them, of course, it'll print up the the IP address of that printer pops up on that on that little printout. Works out really nice. So the other thing I want to kind of change, uh, show you guys, so I'm going in here, is how the caller ID works. Um, the caller ID is actually extremely simple. Literally you go into the cloud, you put in the port number of the, uh, the caller ID box for the who's calling uh, ethernet caller ID box, and which typically is 3520, uh, and your setup is done. When somebody calls in, uh, mine's going to come in with a, a call here, and you're going to get a little box here. It's going to tell you who uh, called in just now, and I have, in this case, Ken Rhea has called in before. Um, 
he's not one of my VIP. I don't have his birthday or anything like this. Um, I have his address information of where he's he's ordered before. I could literally come in here and either create him a reservation, uh, add him to a wait list, or just create a new order for him. I'm going to create a new order. Uh, we're going to say it's a, a delivery order like this. Uh, number of guests that are going to be on this ticket. It gives me some information to verify with the customer, so I know, you know, if he's uh, uh, going to have any special needs or anything like that, or if I need to change this. There's a little search there at the bottom. I'm going to hit finish, and I can send, begin making his order. Um, just that simple. Um, and in this case, you know, once I'm completed with this part, um, you know, I can hit done. It's ready to, to start looking at the delivery process. Um, the delivery process is actually really easy. I'm going to come in here real fast. You're going to have one of the set up for your drivers. It's literally going to show you, here's the orders I have that are waiting for us. So Ken's order that he's made is there. I can uh, click on the little question mark here. And it'll show me what his order is. Um, and I can review that if I needed to. I can click on the address section there and it's going to give me a map on where he's at um, so as you see mine showing uh, it's loading the apple maps and it's showing where he's at um, i can click on the order it's going to put a little green check box there meaning i'm going to assign that order now if i had several of them here i can click which ones i want to assign i'm going to assign this one to carry more carry's going to take that he's now on my dispatch screen he's ready to to take his orders and if I was going to dispatch him, here's the the order he's taking. Again, I can click on the address, look at where that address is. I could uh, click on the question mark, see what order he has. I'm going to go ahead and depart him. Um, so now he's, you'll notice all of a sudden I got a little red dot next to his roots. Um, I can click on that. It would give me, you know, where is Carry Moore going? It's loading the Apple Maps and stuff back behind. Um, you guys are all familiar with the concept of money drop. So when it, he returns and stuff from the dispatch, so if I go here, I can click on this. I can mark them all arrived, piece of cake. We're ready to actually pay his his tickets. You know, and I can come back and say, you know, hey, he got $2. You know, um, doesn't look like my ticket's been paid because it was 104. There we go. Or 104. And he's paid and done. Um, and he's ready to go out on his next uh, next location. So that's how easy it is to set up the caller ID and do the deliveries um, for these customers. So, but Jerry, that's how easy this part is. All right. Well, let's do a comparison, Jeff. You know, I'm asking a question. I think I know the answer to. I already told the audience that I'm using an iPad Pro. Mm -hmm. So what iPad are you using? I'm using a second generation iPad mini. Um, so obviously there's a third generation that's out there. It's faster. Um, Jerry's machine's actually faster. Um, you know, but I do like the iPad mini because the size it fits in my pocket um, of my, my dress locks. Um, and it's a size I actually prefer. Uh, when I end up going and talking to somebody about it, it's something you can just pull out and you got it right there. If you happen to be putting it in an apron or something like that, it works out really nicely. Um, obviously, if you're going to do a countertop unit, that iPad Pro is really nice. Uh, but we do use the iPad Air, uh, the iPad, uh, basically any of the iPad versions that use iOS 11. And we get asked over and over and over again, uh, how much memory does the the iPad need? Do you need to go with one of the expensive models? No, the base model is just fine. Um, people can do that without any problems. That's the, that was the difference that I wanted them to understand, Jeff, is you're using an older iPad mini. I'm using a two-year-old Pro, but still, we're not the most current up-to-date as far as hardware goes. We're using some of the older hardware that is available on the second-hand market. Yeah, 
um, you know, we get that question all the time is do they have to go out and buy the, the newest iPad? No, they need to make sure that it runs iOS 11. Um, that's very important, but if it runs iOS 11, it'll work. Yep. So we're both using iPads that are at least two uh, or more years old. Yeah. All right, so now you're going to see my iPad on the left, and then this camera set up on the right-hand side so you can see me with my hand. I'll be doing the gesturing on that via the camera. There, we're, we have to have a video, and we're going to have to have a um, actual document that will explain the different gestures because there are several. You're used to gesturing, no matter if you have an Android phone or, or an Apple phone. So we're obviously on the Apple device, so we're going to have certain gestures you can do with one finger or two. As it stands now, you can swipe up or down to go from one category to the next. If you have a page that's full of items, you can then swipe right to left with one finger and see the second, third, and fourth pages. Obviously, ringing up, you're just going to touch the item and ring that item up. Two fingers in the ticket window expands it to the full screen. Two fingers in the ticket window will then reduce it back down to the normal size. One finger swiping right to left allows you to void that item. If you touch the item with one finger, you now have the ability to type in, and a keyboard will pop up for you to type the command to the kitchen. You also see with one finger, you have a, in this particular case, a stopwatch. Let's see, there it is, a stopwatch. Now that you touch on, and it allows you then to put a hold and fire on that item. Touching it again will bring it in or send it back out. We'll close that little portion. All right, two fingers touching the item at the same time will then bring up the details of that item. You have the description, which we will show you how to program that in, program that in and you have the item picture. Now, this image can be a different image than what's on the button. So it doesn't have to be the same image. It can be a different one. All right, two fingers swiping down. That will bring in the window that shows the ticket status or the order status. This gives you all the details of that order, who it is, dine in, take out, how long it's been open. And then the on the right-hand side, you have discounts and surcharges that you can add to it. At the bottom, you have the order hold and order note. So this will be an entire order put on hold, not an item that I showed you earlier. Two fingers up allows you to add a menu group, menu item, and a discount on the fly. Swipe one finger down, and you're now back to the ticket window, the buttons. Two fingers swiping left to right in the ticket window will close the ticket. That is something like uh, or send it to the kitchen or put it on hold for recall. Recall here, bring that ticket back up. Add to it, modify it, whatever. Two fingers swiping right to left will then send you to the cash screen where you can cash out that order. So let's go over it real quick. An item, right to left, allows you to void it. Two fingers expands, two fingers reduces. One finger in the button area, or the items area, will allow you to scroll up or down. Two fingers down is the order status. Two fingers up, add an item. 
one finger down here brings you back to here two fingers here in the ticket window left to right will hit it's like hitting the done button you then can recall the order two fingers right left sends you to the cash screen yes it does take some practice but when you get it down you can really be fast with it gesturing can and will add features because you are able to show the ticket show the details of the item so there are things that you can do with gesturing that you really have a difficult time getting to with buttons so now we're going to look at the back office so this is the back office for Adelo Express. When you go to it, you're gonna see this screen here, which is your login screen. Username, this is the same email that you used to log in earlier, and then the same password. Or you can continue with Facebook if that's what you did on the initial login. When you do that, you're gonna see the store that you're working on. In this case, I have multiple stores. I'm going to go in and do my Express Coffee, which is what we've been playing with so far. So you saw initially the item set up when you set up the store. You put in the group, you put in the item name, the price, and you made it taxable. By putting in the group, you then are able to have different uh, functions for that group. Taxation is set up, but if you want to get into the details of it, this is where you need to go. You saw earlier the things that I, were, I was doing on the screen with the food and what have you. When you get into the details of the item, here you go. All right, item name and alternate name. Barcode, this is if you were doing retail, you'd put the barcode here. And since we're the scanners we're using, uh, you would just literally put your cursor here and scan the item, and that would put in the barcode. Product group and category for reporting, and then button color. You have the ability to get into some really detailed colors. They can be very different. Me, I left it here the same and just did a basic color, but once you do the one color, the hexadecimal mark, or color code shows up here. And you, we'll show you here in a minute how you can copy this so you get the same color every time. If you're going to put in a, a picture, you can do so here and load it in. Jeff, I got asked the other day if there are a, what's the size limitation? And I really didn't have an answer. Do you have one off the top of your head? There really isn't a size limitation. It's whatever they feel is really going to be good. Uh, I tend to use uh, dimensions that are about 200 to 200. Um, that tends to work really good. I also, uh, I have a preference for uh, JPEGs and PNGs, uh, just because the, the uh, movement on the PNGs is actually kind of cool um, and doesn't seem to slow anything down. So I do quite a bit with those. Here is a uh, JPEG that's 1200 by 1200. Yeah, go ahead and use and it. Then you, and then 195 by 195. So I've got a wide variety. And, and I just stole these off the internet. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you just cl click on it. Yeah. And the nice part is um, you can actually upload them from your iPad, which is what I think Jerry's doing right here. Yeah. Or of course, uh, since it's a web-based portal, you can upload them from any Windows-based computer as well. Um, and I've even had a couple of people tell me, yeah, they can do it from their, their Chromebooks and stuff as well. So uh, doesn't really care what the operating system is. Uh, it carries cares what the file type is so real simple and if you want to delete it there you go we just delete it now the caption I haven't used that but you could have a caption on the button this type is showing the regular item we will get into in just a minute the pop-up header I'll show you how I use that for my uh, sizes all right so regular item price is it discountable item class and is there a mix and match code now that's the basics there of an item 
So let's go now into the extended settings. We'll go into the mods here in a minute, but I want to show you this is where you choose to have a kitsch printer, bar printer, and label printer. All those are set up here. Is this an open price? If so, you just click it and it turns it into yes, and that's all there is for that. You have multiple prices for dine in, bar, takeout. Then your sales taxes, we do have three. Even though I ask if this is a weighted item, we do not have scales yet, so let's not do that. But you can enter a manual uh, weight for an item. Is this a bar item? This is uh, it's going to help with some of the functionality. Drink qualifier, we do have the uh, required beverage, so that's what this is for. And then finally, here's some description stuff. So you that this is the description that pops up on that detail for the item. So this is where the description is. Uh, at the top up here, this is where you put in the the item name is there at the top. Yeah. yeah. Right. Then you get into the picture for the details right here. So you would then have a picture of the detail, maybe a plated, and then a different picture for the button. All right, now that is the extent of the detailed items before I get into modifiers. Any questions popping up, Jeff? No, we're good. Okay. I see one there that says, please review slowly once again. I'm not sure which which part of this is we're supposed to do that. But I'll go ahead and I'll do some modifier stuff. Force modifiers. Okay. You can add modifiers here. These are the ones that I have in there so far. Or I can create a new. So now I'm able to put in small, medium, large for this item. You can put a group in. Give it a name and put in the new modifier group. So either way you want to do it. Under advanced, these, these I like. You can have a template, and I have a template for coffee ads, but you can then put in a new group. I had to move my keyboard out of the way. Let me pull it back up. You can have eight, eight different groups. I can copy from another group or create my own. So the copy feature here is actually really powerful because if you have, let's say, a sandwich shop and they have small changes and stuff between uh, groups, you can easily go in and instead of having to recreate the wheel each time, you can copy that group and just make the small changes that you need to. Uh, making that menu creation stuff for more complex menus much, much faster. Um, so that should really help during that, that menu creation process. I'm going to do some no. You have the ability to do no. You see all these, light, add, extra, subs. 
and then you got you down into the doubles, triples, halves. So you have those abilities. Minimum and maximum options are programmed in here, and then add the new modifier. Selecting a base really helps if you already have that set up. And then price, if you have one. And you'll see each one of these has its own ability to have a price. Oops, I missed something up there. Yeah, the base modifier didn't get selected. Yeah. Oop, 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 oop. Right there. Pretty new. Modes. Even autocorrect gets you on this. <laughs> All right. So that is where you would set up your advanced modifiers. Once you set up your template, then you can copy that to other groups as well. I've got one in here for uh, coffee ads that has got some whipped cream and stuff that you uh, would want for an ad on a uh, one of those special coffees. All right. Any questions popping up on that? Uh, I think we're good. That's probably because it's a lot like uh, Adelo, Adelo uh, POS. Mm -hmm. So one of the things uh, Jerry's a little too modest to show is that um, the cool part about using the iPad is it has the voice recognition in it. And so literally, uh, if you have a menu, you can hit that little microphone button, uh, say what you want, tap the keyboard, boom, it puts it in, you go to the next one, do the same thing. Uh, I had one young lady who worked for us did the entire menu that way. Um, and it, it was amazingly fast uh, and, and reasonable to do. Um, it was kind of fun. Yeah, but my uh, my iPad does speak redneck, so in, in Southern, so it, it does work. <laughs> it it can understand you, huh? Yeah, it does. It speaks my language. All right, so let's do a, a matrix stuff. This is a feature from Zira that does some really cool things with regard to setting up multiple items that are in a matrix type of setup. This is great for pizza, sodas, sandwiches, subs, bar items, lots of different op, uh, options for you if you get creative with how you set it up. So you'll need a base item you'll start with. I'm going to go with one I already had in here, but I'll show you what the feature, what the uh, item choices are. So you create your base item, your product category, the type of item, is it discountable? This is your base item. You can also set up your print options, your modifier options, all those different things are set up here for the base item. It's like setting up a regular menu item. No difference. Once you have your base item set, then you can go in and do your matrix. So I'm going to select sub as my base. Item common name. Sandwich. <laughs> Put in your picture, your your detail picture, and your price. Then you have your columns. Now I'm going to do the Size, I'm going to do bread, cheese, and then meat. So you add in your options for your size.
in that, you can alter the price as well for that option. I'm not going to do that at this point. So now I've got four there on the sizes. Let's come back in here to the breads. I want to put a couple here just to get us an idea of what we're doing. Jesus. Jeff, you remember when you did your the Zero database? What, how many options in pizza did you wind up? Any, any idea? Uh, I can get into the million. Yep, you went crazy, um, didn't you? I went a little crazy. Um, really, what this does for you is on the back end, it's creating all possible scenarios for you um, without you having to do all the typing and stuff. So, uh, it, it multiplies really fast. You're ended up, you know, since you have four columns of items. Um, you know, if you've only got four items in column one and one column and I, one item in column two, you're really only going to create, you know, one item, uh, four items. If you have two items in column two, you're going to be creating eight items. Three is, is, and you can kind of see how this all of a sudden starts exponentially growing, um, very, very quickly. And especially when you're doing pizza toppings, it allows you to go through and create every single size, every single topping option, and therefore every single price combination that the customer could possibly want without having to do all the typing for it um, and putting every item in there. So it really is a very powerful feature. Um, and the way Jerry's showing it is actually pretty good, where you have sizes, breads, cheeses and meats, um, he's going to be able to create every sandwich combination in just a few seconds. Yeah, see, so now it's... 96 items. Mm -hmm. You go through and you put in the right prices. Or you can delete that item if you don't want to show that. But it just created every combination. So as you see, you can put the prices where you want them. And when you're done, all the way at the bottom, build matrix items. Mm -hmm. And then it will put it right into the database onto the menu. Jeff, what I missed? You've got it, boss. That was great. Any questions popping up? So far, there are no questions. Everybody seems to understand. Well, you did it right when you said we did almost, a, or you did almost a million items for zero. I know you have built a huge file just to see what you could do one day, right? Yeah, just to see if how big I could make it and how much I could do yeah. and how reasonable it was. Um, Pam's asking um, if this is something uh, you'd use for specials uh, at a pizza place. Um, like large pizzas and sodas and wings. You could absolutely make combos and stuff this way. Um, to do that, you could easily go in and um, decide you want to use it for just the toppings and stuff on a pizza um, and go through and do it that way. So it'd make all the modifiers and stuff for all your toppings. Um, I cheat and use this for beers and stuff a lot of times because I have, you know, your bottles and drafts and things like this and if uh, to go through and create all those different styles and stuff takes a little bit of time in here I can just go in and put in that I'm going to serve it by the bottle by the can by you know uh, the pitcher and then go in and put all the beer types in here and boom I've got all my pricing combinations and everything uh, the other thing that makes it really nice is to go back and change all the prices you just go in your matrix and change the prices and 
you're done. It's all in one screen. And as fast as you can hit tab down, you can change all the prices. So for maintenance purposes, it's actually pretty nice as well. All right, we, are we good on this, guys? Okay, then I'm gonna go with the, we're good. All right, next up is reservation and wait list. I'm gonna start here in the back so that we can actually do the setup for it here. You'll notice that there is a uh, area in the store config for hostess. So you're gonna go here and actually just turn it on. So you do have to have it turned on to make this work. Here are the other options on the screen that you're gonna need as well do you want to associate it with a customer that is you want to build a customer database from the reservations the next time that customer comes in then their account will have been set up and therefore you're tracking history you're tracking history of their purchases and their visits so do you want to do that that's up to you on my database, I have it as yes. I'm also on my left hand over here, I'm bringing up another database so that we can see how this works. Okay, the other reservation options are guest check. Do you wanna print it when they sit down? You can do that yes or no on the wait list enable it yes or no and once you do that you won't do you want to can require it to be associated with a house account or a close a, a customer account that's a yes or a no once you've done all this you hit save and now you have reservations and wait list turned on i'm going to bring up my database for my salon and spa This is the one I have it set up for. Number of guests is one. That was one of the defaults that I set up. And these are the chairs. The actual, I've named the chair Susie, John, and Becky but you can also have other chairs associated with this, this being a six chair salon. Now this is where you would have the, the person about to be seated. You would then touch and then what they're getting and then have them seated. Now that is simple enough. That's where the, you put the, the people. Now that table shows or that chair shows as occupied. If you had a wait list going on, you would go into the hostess area. And now at the bottom, you see you have uh, three circles, now three dots, if you will. Come over to the left. This is where the reservations would be created. I'm going to click on new reservation, date and time. If you wish to select a person or chair that they're going to be in, you can do that. And then if this is a new customer, you put them in here. If it's an existing customer, you can put their phone number there. I'm going to put in a new customer. number of people we need to default that to one and now that reservation is made now you'll also notice that when the reservation time is correct it will highlight or make this 
they will be checked in. So this person can be checked in at this point. Checking in, yes. And now that person is ready to go with the chair, Becky. They're getting a men's haircut. Done. So I went, that's how you set up the reservation and wait list. And that's also how you use it as well. So that's all uh, you on that one. Okay, so uh, I'm kind of assuming everybody's probably had customers approach them and want to do cash discounts in the past. Uh, but if you haven't, I'm going to give you a quick lowdown of what a cash discount is in this context. Um, a cash discount program really allows somebody to have a surcharge that appears on their, their receipt. Um, the customer determines what that surcharge amount is, anywhere between zero and uh, 5%. And this discount or this surcharge is actually removed if the customer pays by cash or gift card, um, but is going to be charged to the customer or to the cardholder if they happen to choose to, to pay by uh, debit or credit. And this is becoming a little more popular um, for those people that are really wanting to kind of recover some of their credit card processing fees. Um, and the, the cost of doing business back from the customer, they can easily do that. And this is now a feature in the Aldelo Express. Uh, the customer can define how much that is. And like I said, between zero and 5%. Um, and given that if they're using our, our most expensive option, the starter plan, their effective rate's gonna be about 2.5%. So if somebody chose to have, let's say a 3% uh, uh, cash discount, what that's going to do is they're going to end up actually making a little bit of money on their credit card processing. Um, if they chose to go to 4%, they're going to make a little bit more. Um, so it's an option here where uh, customers can help recover those fees for their, their credit card processing. And like I said, that is now available. Customers can start doing that in the latest edition of the, the Aldelo Express. Um, and that is currently available. So, you know, uh, they can start putting apps in for that immediately. Um, it is only available in the, the starter plan. Uh, and yes, Pam, it is perfectly legal. Um, it is actually very common. You'll notice if you go to a gas station, gas stations give you a cheaper price for, for cash and a higher price for credit and debit. Um, that's pretty common across the United States. So you do see that. Um, and what we're doing does comply with the Dodd-Frank rules. Um, and yes, it is printed on the customer receipt. It shows up there as a convenience fee. So Convenience fee is the real key to this. You cannot call it certain things, but you can call it a convenience fee that does allow it to be legal but this has been done for years at gas stations so it's not something new there's, there's only a very few point of sale systems that will do this so yes it is legal but you have to use it as a convenience fee not as a um, you know a surcharge and we do still recommend customers you know disclose this to their their patrons um, you have to you have to Either put it way. at the door or where their point of sale is. You have to put a sign out. Yeah. So it's it's one of those situations that, um, you know, we do recommend that they, they comply with that and make sure that there's some type of sign or some type of information for that. But if customers want to do it or approaching you for it, they can do it. Uh, it can be as little as 1%. Maybe. Can you do half percent, Steph? I don't know why, but you can yeah, do 1%. Yeah, sure. Maybe do quarter percent if I want to, or an eighth of a percent. Yeah. You know, sure, uh, but the key is, is is really it's between zero and five percent. We're not we're going to gouge cardholders either, and and want to be fair to everybody, but it does allow merchants to start recovering now for what the credit card processing fees are. Um, the other feature and stuff that's on here that you guys will be really excited about is tokenization. Um, customers do have to opt into this program. But if you've ever had a customer that's called you up and gone, I've closed my batch, and you know, what do I do about adjusting those those credit cards? 
because uh, I forgot to add tips on them and they've had to go back and do any type of manual entry or go back and wait for a credit card processor to get those. Um, we have a great solution for you. Uh, we now do the tokenization and stuff and here again, it's an opt-in program. So customers do need to opt into this. It is only available on Adelo Express. They literally will be able to uh, upload their their receipts and stuff to us um, with the the uh, tip amounts on those. And if the customer signed and everything for that tip amount, we can actually go in and adjust it immediately. Uh, when we do that, the customer is going to get a, a little button that shows up on their uh, end of day information so that they can go in and review those before the card holders actually charged make sure everything is absolutely correct if it is they accept the additional charges and the card holders are charged for the additional amount the real neat part about this um, is that it's a separate transaction from the initial transaction so it reduces that chargeback risk um, and makes it to where people can recover those tip amounts, um, making it a lot nicer. We will expand this functionality and what it allows customers to do um, over the next couple of months. And so example, we're going to be looking at adding this functionality for bar tabs um, so that they can do a, a bar tab for one amount and close it for another. We'll be looking at adding it for delivery charges so that you can close out tickets and stuff in the future. Um, without having to and add those tips and everything else without having them uh, be present there. Um, this feature actually speeds up the end of day process because if it's turned on, um, it will actually go out and post authorized transactions and stuff during the day, uh, but still allow you to be able to go back and adjust the tips through the point of sale software if there's something there. Um, so those types of things are, are coming up but this is the first step in that having that tokenization is now those customers that failed to add a tip or something like that to that transaction we can go back and help them with that um, realistically in real time um, they don't have to wait anymore for two or three days for a processor to get that information for them and they're not exposing that credit card number to the the customer um, or to the merchant um, so it's remaining PCI compliant as well so um, I see there's lots of questions out there. It doesn't look like any questions about this. Um, anybody have any questions about the, the either the cash discount or how tokenization is going to help your customers? Well, here's one. Does the end of day cashier send to the batch in EDC as in the AFR software? software? Something about tokenization is going to make it send differently, Jeff, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that happens now if you're, you know, uh, using a host capture platform is each transaction has to be updated against the PAX unit um, when you add the tips. And this process um, can take, you know, six or eight seconds per transaction uh, to update against the PAX device. Um, when you do the tokenization, we go through and periodically throughout the day, go ahead and close those transactions that have a tip on them. Um, so that your end of day process is actually much, much faster because if somebody makes a mistake, they can actually go back and change it right on the iPad. Um, so it makes it a lot easier and a lot faster. So and then when Pam's we say speed up the end of day, that's what we're referring to, right? That's what we're referring to. Yes, sir. Okay. So while we're talking about it, what are the end of day processes for closing out? the Delo Express and the batches. So the real uh, major component is that you have to, you know, close your cash tray um, or your staff banks. Once those are closed, um, the system will actually auto batch for those customers that set that up. That's a setting that's in the back office cloud. If they choose to have it, um, they can turn that on. And then one of the iPads will automatically trigger all of the batches on all the PAX devices. Um, so that it's done on a on a regular uh, basis, but uh, they can also do it manually by going to miscellaneous, going to end of day, and there'll actually be a batch button there, and they can close their batch and stuff there. Uh, the close of batch is almost instantaneous; it it takes just a few seconds. 
uh, for the PAX device to close that. It's about six seconds um, to do that, and they're completed. At that point, they do have reports and stuff they can review, review there in the back office, um, and that's, you know, uh, all available to them. They can go back and review those reports and stuff at any time, uh, just like they can on any of our other point of sales. So, so really what are basic. the mandatory reports that have to be run? There are no mandatory reports that have to be run. Um, simply closing the cash trays and stuff so that you can batch out is all that's really required. I had a question from uh, someone to go over the cash discounts again, make sure we're clear on that. So uh, the cash discount is a program where it allows uh, the merchants to choose a, a percentage between zero and 5% that they're going to have added to the, all of their, their tickets um, as a convenience fee. And if the customer pays by cash or other means other than debit and credit, um, that dis that convenience fee is discounted off. Um, and if they happen to pay by uh, debit or credit, obviously the cardholder is going to pay that additional fee. Um, again, since most people's, uh, even if they're on our highest uh, cost, the starter plan, uh, doing this, their effective rate's about 2.3 to 2.5 percent. Um, they, uh, if they choose to have 3% as their, their option, for example, they're going to actually be recovering more money than credit card processing is costing them. Um, if they choose to lower percent, obviously they're going to kind of be eating some of those costs as well or, or uh, splitting those costs with the, the card holder, but that's how that works. And again, they really do need to have signage up for this if they're going to be doing this type of program, they need to, to go print up some signs and put them up uh, where they're visible. Typically, I'd suggest doorways or, or countertops um, where people can see that. So the uh, line item is actually going to be on the gas check below sales tax and before that, total. That's correct, yes. So it will be on the gas check. Guests will be made aware of that, not only by the signage, but when they get their gas check, they see that and then they can be encouraged to pay with cash to eliminate that fee. So if they are going to accept the cash when they come back to the Adelo Express terminal to the pay screen and recall that ticket, if then select the cash amount, that will then ignore the convenience fee and give change based upon the actual cash price. Yes. So we got a, a uh, if we're ready, I can kind of move on to the QA side. I see we're getting quite a few questions yep. and stuff that are popping up here. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of work from the bottom up that I have right now. Um, Gil's got one. He says, um, about the PAX devices, is Adela going to have uh, wireless or Bluetooth devices at cost? Um, we've talked about doing that. Right now, the request for Bluetooth devices is pretty small. Um, and we have to order them in, in batches of between 100 and 250 in order to get any type of decent discount worth doing this. Um, so right now, those can be ordered through POS portal. Uh, customers or, or dealers are welcome to do that. Uh, they're about $360 a piece um, at cost. That's with key injection. Um, and when you do that, those devices just need to be um, uh, available so we can put it into our broad pay system and board those for you. So these are the D210s. These are the D210s. Um, so that's, you know, readily available. Um, and if we get more requests and stuff for them, we will start, start having those. Uh, Pam's asking, uh, can we make the ticket uh, larger on the, the customer receipt and on the kitchen chit? Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of limitations there by the hardware providers. So Epson and Star really only have two sizes that you can have for the uh, printout when you're doing um, iOS. And right now we're using the large. So that is the large size. It's, it's not, can't go any bigger um, 
that's just what it is. I was kind of chuckling there. You know, that is the large. <laughs> that is the large. Uh, Diane's asking, um, why would we not roll uh, the amount above the effective rate and profit rather than um, issue it back to the merchant? So uh, some companies do go, hey, look, you know, we're going to put in an effective rate and anything, you know, that effective rate above the the thing is, is paid to the dealer. Um, there's already money in this pie for everybody. Um, what we're really trying to do is make it to where if the merchant's collecting that, a couple of things are going to happen. One, they're going to want to take more credit cards. Um, it's going to help them grow their business. We're, we're helping them get to that point. If they're taking more credit cards, that's going to benefit all of us. Um, it's that simple. It's also going to create just a great sales situation here where you can go, hey, look, essentially they can make their credit card processing free or even pay them to take credit cards. Um, if they're putting in a high enough effective rate. That should make it anybody that comes up to you and goes, hey, I want to compete on price. How can you compete on price when somebody's going to say, we're going to pay you to take credit cards? We're going to show you how. Um, I don't care how much, how low somebody's credit card processing fee is. Well, you can come in and say zero or, you know, you're actually going to make money on credit card processing. You just blew out your competition. Um, you don't have to go through and do price comparisons. You don't have to do any of that other stuff. You just blew them away. Um, so hopefully that, you know, uh, helps you there. Uh, Pam's asking, what would cause the auto batch not to occur? Uh, my first things I'd say is somebody didn't set it up. That would be the, the first and easiest thing that would not happen. Obviously, anything that would make the iPad not run. Um, so if somebody's no actually turned it off, no internet. Um, those types of things would would definitely do it. That's about it. That's about the only things that would kill that auto batching. Um, I think I've kind of got everybody's. Uh, do all iPads have to be owned? No, or, only the one that you have setting up as a trigger. Um, so that you know. Uh, if you have iPad, let's say three is going to be the triggering iPad. It just has to be on that local network. So, I mean, if somebody's taking it home, obviously it's not going to be there to, to trigger those devices. Um, it has to be on, has to be running our app. That's about it. Um, and here again, they can do it manually. If they miss it or don't want to do it through the automatic process, they don't have to. Um, but if they happen to have one that is they're using as a, a – uh, desktop or countertop unit um, and, and have it in a stand and stuff, they could easily make designate that one where it's always powered on to be that unit and do it. Um, you're going to have to charge them, you know, so if when they plug them in at night, as long as they just have one of them is running our app, piece of cake. Uh, but it does have to be the same one all the time. It has to be whatever station they've designated for that. Um, Do all the iPads not be on? No, I don't. Um, and so Gil's asking, what is the special for this month? Uh, you're going to see that actually hit probably right after this uh, thing. We're really going to be pushing that ca cash discount program is the option through the starter plan. So customers that do set up the starter plan and stuff can have that option to do the cash discount uh, program because that's going to be where we roll it out first. Um, and that's going to be the special we're doing for this month. Uh, we're also going to keep the um uh express saver plan that's going to be out there and is is still going to be available we're not going to turn that off um it just most likely won't go out as much of our marketing this month that was very popular last month we did that was a lot of and so uh, you'll take advantage of that i know you have some customers that were looking at that program if if, if anyone doesn't know that is the Adelo Express with all the starter plan benefits at the ultimate plan price of five cents and eight basis points. You do not have to board a customer under that plan. You can board them on the starter plan if you wish. So when you are boarding and doing the application, 
you need to make sure that either your own starter plan, if you only want the starter plan price, but if you want the special and promotion, you have to be on the Express Saver application in order to get that promotion. Anything else other than that, we're going to board at normal prices. Yeah. Uh, Pam's saying it's difficult to support without being able to remote into the iPad. Uh, I'll be honest, Pam, I strongly disagree. I've been doing this now for about five years. And anytime a customer calls me up and all I have to do is log into their cloud and change the setting, that's a lot easier. Um, I don't have to go out to their location. I don't have to mess with it. It's, it's a lot easier. And the only thing that actually ever goes wrong with the app, they delete it and download it from the app store again. Well, you know? That's worst case. I just turn the dead gun thing off and back on. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's, a heck of a lot easier because there's a lot less moving parts and a lot less stuff to mess with. So you don't uh, dial into an iPad. Apple doesn't let you dial into an iPad. That's an Apple restriction. But you mm -hmm. can get into the back office and make all the changes you want there. Mm -hmm. uh, Pam's also asking about transferring their AFR menu to Express. Um, it's really easy. You download the app from our website. It's on the downloads page, uh, www.audello.com forward slash downloads. Um, so right on there, click on it, download it, and there's one button on the app. Um, and, and the video and everything for it's right on the Audello Express website. But you push the one button that's on there, it extracts all the data from your Audello POS and gives you a file. You go to your Audello Express uh, website, log in, click on create new store under stores, and you have a button there that says uh, upload Eldelo POS file. And, and boom, upload the file and your store is completed. Whole process, I think I covered on the, uh, on our, our website in a video in a minute and nine seconds, and that's including me blabbing on. So uh, and everybody here knows I can talk forever. So minute and nine seconds is pretty impressive with me talking. Um, Diana's got a good question about uh, the discounting. How do, uh, how do you, how, yeah. How do you note the discount when boarding? Um, I'm adding it to the form. It'll be on there this afternoon. So, uh, but they can email to sales at Odello.com and tell us the customer that you want to do it to and piece of cake. Um, it takes seconds. You get a confirmation email back. Um, Pam says, ticket number or order number does not appear on the credit card receipt. Is this an option? Uh, yes, it's an option. Call support. They'll help you turn it on um, for that customer. Um, and it's it's on all the guest checks. Um, and it is on the, the uh, what's called the EDC draft um, for the customers. So they can turn that on. Uh, I think we got all the questions. I'm not seeing any new questions popping in here. Uh, tip suggestions. Oh, tip suggestions. Uh, Mr. Yen, yes. Um, you can show tip suggestions on the, the uh, credit card receipt, on the guest receipt. Uh, it also pops up on the, the iPad themselves if you're having the customer sign on the iPads. Um, and they're pre-programmable pre -programmable in the back office of the, the Aldello. They're under uh, tenders. So you can set them up right there. Uh, how to cancel an order before it's saved. They're really, it's always saved. So if you click on the ellipsis and click void, you can void the order. Um, ellipsis is the three little dots. We use it for the miscellaneous key um, there. So in the order, simply click on that, click void, the order's gone. Um, Pam is saying clocking in is different from AFR as the clock in is on the first place. Explain how it works. So a lot of this depends on how your customer is set up and what pages they have as their, their login page and their, their starting page. Um, if they're a driver, they're going to see it in the driver dispatch screen. If they're a server, they're going to be able to, they're going to have this come up and prompt them to clock in. Um, but Jerry, I see yours is up. If you can click on the ellipsis, um, 
for the miscellaneous key. And you'll see there it goes into time cards. No matter which way they do this, it's all the same thing. Um, in his case, he's already clocked in. So he's able to, the next thing that knows logically he's going to do is uh, take a break. But also you'll see there's a clock out button there. So his begin break is successful. Um, if he goes back into time cards, it's going to tell him to end break because um, that's the next logical step in that process. Um, you know, and then when he comes back, it's going to, he's going to have the options for, um, you know, doing another break for lunch or whatever else he wants to do. Uh, and of course, his last break and then clock out. It's really the same process you've dealt with in uh, Adela for Restaurants or Zara. The only thing that's really different is your breaks aren't labeled breaks or lunch. Um, they're all just breaks. Um, it doesn't really matter. The, what matters is the length of time you take um, for those breaks. So uh, you'll see him on here. Here's the here's his time card. Shows his break time for his first break. Uh, any gratuities and stuff. If he had second break, third break, you know, it would show those on here. Um, your time clock button is not highlighted. It's because you're a salary employee. So you need to change your your uh, settings to an hourly employee. That's that's why, Pam. Um, so Diane's asking, is there any roadmap for a wireless PAX unit uh, to do pay at the table? Uh, it's been there since the original installation on February 28th. Um, you can order the PAX D210. They're readily available. You literally hand the, you know, uh, when you initiate the payment from the iPad, you hand the device to the the person and ready to rock and roll. Um, and it's a complete payment on the the iPad or on the uh, PAX uh, D210 if you'd like. Um, the D210 will even print a a receipt for you. So uh, I was looking to see if we've missed any any others. Looks like we've got them all. Um, any other questions out there? Jerry, I think we got everybody's questions. Yeah, I think so. I was just scanning around to see if I could stir up any, any other questions. Let's see, I got uh, Jim Sequin saying all of his customers uh, use gift cards to the processors. Uh, what do you suggest? Gift cards is coming soon. That we we've been writing that, so it's coming. It is coming. Mm -hmm. I think that's the last of our questions here. Um, so. Uh, we do have another training and stuff we're going to do here in about an hour and a half. Obviously, you've come to this one. You probably don't need to come to that one. But if you have more questions or something popped up, you're welcome to to join us then. Uh, we also, you know, me and Jerry are, are available via email uh, most days. Um, we do schedule time and stuff to talk to people about things that come up. Uh, obviously, our tech support groups available to you. Uh, for those customers that have actual Aldelo Pay, you know, if you're a dealer and you have a question about uh, what's the status of your customer, where's things going there, we do have a phone number for that. It's 925-621-7836. Uh, uh, that is for dealers only. Get you right through to the people that are, are handling those merchant processing accounts, and you can definitely directly talk to those guys. Um, and they're here eight to five Monday through Friday Pacific Standard Time. Um, if you have any questions about merchant processing. Other than that, thank you for, for spending time with us. Um, and uh, we hope everybody's very successful and happy and has a great day. We're gonna record this. Uh, we've recorded this training. We're gonna record the one at two o'clock and then I'll merge the two into a single or not single, it's too long. I'll, I'll do about 45, four or five videos that are 15 minutes long or so of each of these uh, recordings of the training. And we will post those to YouTube uh, sometime later this week, first next week. So we do record these, we do post them for you 
to go back to, refer to, and for your new employees. And don't forget the new referral partner training every Friday at 2 o'clock. Uh, for any additional training and questions that you might have, we do make ourselves uh, very available. Thanks all for attending, and uh, we'll see you next quarter on another one of these major deep dives.